Welcome, I'm Pam Laricchia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Leah Rose. Hi, Leah. Hi. (laughs) Now, Leah and I connected online pretty recently and I really enjoyed what she's been sharing about her unschooling experience. So I was very happy when she agreed to join me on the podcast. To get us started, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? I am married for coming up on 32 years, and uh, we have five children. Our oldest is 27. Our youngest is about to turn 17. Um, And we've been unschooling since about 2008, I want to say. So we kind of run the gamut when we uh, decided to start homeschooling. The kids all had a choice about whether they wanted to stay in school or leave. And um, our oldest at the time was finishing her sophomore year of high school, her 10th grade. And so she was, she's also very Mm -hmm. academic and school was sort of her meal. So she was happy Mm -hmm. to stay. Um, Our next youngest uh, was um, finishing seventh grade, about to go into eighth grade. And our school runs K through eight. So he was about to hit the, you know, (laughs) the top, the pinnacle. So he, he decided to stay for the next year for eighth grade. And, uh, and then our fifth grader and our third grader were jumped at the chance to leave. And our youngest had only done preschool. He was set to start kindergarten the next year. And, um, since his older brother who was in third grade was choosing, I just kind of like shuffled him into, you know, <laughs> if, if your older brother, who's your big pal, isn't going to go to school, neither will you. Um, <laughs> and he's actually, that was one of the impetuses for uh, homeschooling was because he, I could tell that he, that school and what was required of a little boy sitting in school was not going to serve him and his experience of learning. Um, and so he was really part of the reason why I wanted to try homeschooling because I just couldn't picture him going off to school, ever, getting him out of bed much <laughs> every morning, <laughs> much less getting him out the door into school and having, you know, the preschool was a bit of enough of a challenge that way. So, um, so yeah, so he's never been to school. So we have one who only went to school and one who never went to school and then kind of the gamut in between. Ah. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, our middle daughter who's, who left school at, um, fifth grade, mm-hmm. uh, just after fifth grade, she's about to graduate college and our son who did eighth grade. And then he was, saw his siblings through that year of eighth grade. He was watching them be at home having fun. And fun. He, you know what? I think I'll try this unschooling thing. So he didn't go to high school. Um, and so, and he graduated a couple of years ago with a criminal justice degree and he just recently um, completed the police academy and he was hired at a local um, municipal police department. So uh, he is working. And then our other two, our two youngest boys, the one who never unschooled and, and, uh, one who left at third grade are both uh, going to community college and um, picking up credit. So, so yeah, so things have just sort of progressed from, you know, <laughs> the fun of, of uh, life without school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of it, we dive into that a little bit more on how you discovered unschooling and what your move looked like, because, so it was your youngest really that had you um, looking for something different because you knew you, it didn't seem like this was going to work for him. Like the school path wasn't going to work. Yeah. Well, that definitely was a huge concern and it hadn't really dawned on me. See, cause we live, we live in a very small town. There's a private religious school here um, that all of our kids went through. It goes K through eight and then um, high school is nine through 12. Um, and they were all enrolled, and that's actually where I went because I grew up just a mile down the road. And we live in my husband, the house my husband grew up in. He was born in our dining room, um, <laughs> so he went to those schools too, um, a few years ahead of me. But um, he was serving. My husband was serving on this board of trustees at the time, and um, they went through this period where they started raising the tuition rates, and we had three kids in the elementary school, one in the high school, which was even more expensive. And I just say the the whole thing started because he came home from a meeting one night, a board of trustees meeting and said, they raised the tuition again. And he was, I think like maybe the only one who voted against the tuition raise because people like us who don't get, wouldn't get a lot of financial support, but also can't 
necessarily, you know, we're sort of in the yeah. middle bracket where we can't afford, you know, that kind of education for a large family. Uh, we were kind of, kind of stuck. So anyway, I just looked at him when he said that. I was like, you know, we could keep our kids home and pay them to learn for a lot less. <laughs> and we kind of looked at each other and went, Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hadn't heard the word unschooling at the time. Like I knew there was this homeschooling thing, but to me it was teach them at home as a, you know, yeah. um, formal kind of learning thing. And anyway, so we actually just from that la- that kind of launched us in the conversation and and it was a relief to me because I had this concern with our youngest of how that was even gonna look for him to be going to school. Like it just I couldn't picture it. And so um, we spoke through the, it was the springtime of the, the end of that year, and we started talking to the kids, and you know, and they immediately made their choices of what they wanted to do. And then summer rolled around, and they were done their school year, and I started thinking ahead to, okay, so if we're going to be doing this school thing. And I realized that the two who had decided to stay home, who had some experience in school, they loved being there with their friends. They loved their teachers. We had great teachers in the school and they hated the schoolwork. And I'm thinking, thinking, wait, so now they're going to stay home. They're not with their friends. They don't have their teachers they love and I'm going to hand them the schoolwork. Like, how is that? (laughs) How's that going to (laughs) work? So I jumped online. Um, I think I might've just gone straight to Amazon and started to look for books on like homeschooling, like what are yeah. the options? And I landed on John Holt. And um, and that, and so I ordered his, and that just whoosh, that opened the floodgate. So as I did a lot, ton of reading that summer into the fall, and I, because the whole unschooling, you know, the idea of learning without the formality and, you know, I love that. So I started reading and I was just handing each book off to my husband as I finished. And he, he was reading, you know, along behind me and it just made so much sense. Um, and I had in my early, before I became a mom, I had uh, taught for a few years in the high school locally uh-huh. here and that our, our daughter went to, that I went to. And, um, and I have to say there was always some part of me as a teacher that, you know, when kids would say, why do we have to learn this? That there was a part of me that that really resonated with. It was like, yeah, why? Well, well, I have to teach you. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to learn it because I have to teach you. That's my job. And like, I didn't feel like there were good answers for some of that, and um, and so there was always a little bit of a part of you know that I just even though school, I loved school going you know growing up. I didn't struggle with school. It was easy. It was kind of where I could shine and feel confident and. Um, but there was always that part of it that, like, why do you have to learn all this stuff? And so um, the thing that really appealed to me about unschooling is kids learning what they need to know when they need to know it. And um, so that that's sort of how we moved into the whole thing. Wow. I really love um, that observation of that that difference, right? Because when I, I think back over, you know, I did well in school, too. I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. But you're right. It, it was always something different than life, right? Those were two separate things. Right. This is what I right. did at school. This is what I learned at school, you know, and then I'm out of school and it's something completely different. They were unrelated most, most of the time because the things that I was learning weren't things that I was using day to day when I got out, right? Because this is right. something you should learn for someday, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, or, or even if it wasn't for some day, it was for the grade on the paper, you yeah, know, yeah. for the gold star. Um, I, I can honestly say that, you know, for me, as much as school gave me a place to shine and feel confident growing up, um, it also had kind of a, a damaging effect. And I remember, uh, getting to my last term of college. And I was looking at graduation. I was about to get my last report card. And I literally had the thought go through my head, you know, because I was a straight A student and always had been. I was like, well, now how am I going to know that I'm any good? Uh Like that thought literally went through my head as a 21 year old, you know, 20, because I was so used to, you know, evaluating my worth 
through my grades. Yeah. I'm this, you know, straight. So even for kids who, who really shine that there can be, you know, depending on, on what else is going on in their lives, that there can be an unhealthy aspect even to the, the success of getting good grades and being able to manage school with, you know, a lot of yeah. athletes. No, that's so true. And, and I think at the top and the bottom, right? We just get, yeah. that's, that's the way we're judged. And that's how we, we think of ourselves, right? It's like, well, yeah. without that, how am I going to know whether I'm doing well or not well? How, how am I going to know if I'm a person who typically doesn't do well, right? I mean, imagine, right. you know, how um, kids feel about themselves when they're not doing well at school. Right. And, and they carry that out with them, knowing that I, you know, that they identify with with being mediocre or whatever terms are being used to them. Right. When people right. talk about grades um, and talk about mm-hmm. people um, at, at judging people ver- ver- based on based on what their grades are. Yeah. Right? Wow. Well, I, I think it's, it's the comparison thing is mm-hmm. really difficult. And what's interesting to me is I think part of the struggle I saw with my youngest and that I was concerned about with him, I think that had he gone to school, he probably would have um, quickly been put through a diagnostic, you know, they would have diagnosed him with ADHD and with auditory processing and the, cause I'd done enough reading and I knew enough about those things to kind yeah. of be able to see it even in his day-to-day life where he wasn't being asked to, you know, follow directions, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, even in preschool, his, his worst times were project time, you know, things where anything where they were asking the kids to stop doing their thing and focus and do this project or this, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so that was my concern with him. And what I noticed through him never going to school, and now just, it was in September, he started at community college as a 16-year-old. He's dual enrolled, so he's earning um, high school credits towards a diploma at the same time as they also are college credits mm. towards a, a two-year associate's degree. Um, and, you know, he's getting straight A's as a 16-year-old, you know, at community college. And I really think that... Um, his experience of himself as a learner, if he had started when he was, you know, five or six, yeah. might have damaged his ability to experience himself as you know, just who he is. So that by the time he got to where he is, I don't know if he would have been able to succeed, you know, the same way. You know what I mean? And and, mm-hmm. and it was interesting to me that when he started at the college and was, you know, doing his first tests and things like that. I, it was a couple days, like I knew he had taken a test and I had forgotten about it. And a few days after, like a week later, I was like, hey, did you ever get the test back? And he was like, oh yeah, like, I forget what it was. It was, or, or I guess it was, maybe it was a paper. He got like an A plus or something. He had, he had not bothered. I was like, oh, well, that's great. When he finally told me, I was like, how did you not tell me this? He's like, I forgot. <laughs> I mean, like right? that's how casual he about his grades because he wasn't like to me he didn't grow up with it being a big deal yeah. and it was just so funny I said well did the teacher write any comments and he goes yeah and he goes well what do you say I don't know I didn't read them all <laughs> like, <laughs> so I looked at the paper and you know the teacher had lots of great things to say about how he you know uh, this this English essay he'd written and and it was just so funny to me that you know because when I was his age it was all about the grades and the teacher comments and all the time. I mean, sort of is vicariously now through my kids. It's like, well, what are the, partly because I want to see how the experiment worked out, you know? (laughs) And he's my big experiment having never been to school. And anyway, but it just, his relationship to, to grades and to that kind of feedback, it just was so much more relaxed. There's just so much space around. It's kind of like, you know, it's whatever. And, and I think part of that might be because he's a boy. Sometimes boys are a little more, you know, well, I, that really depends because I, I have another son who was <laughs> much more into what the grades were. So maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe a, not it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that might be a, anyway, it could be partly a personality thing. But um, I just really, to me, it kind of struck me. I sort of wondered how, how much you know, there was maybe a little connection there, but between the fact that he didn't grow up being measured and, and graded and, you know, having to deal with that kind of, uh, mindset Mm -hmm. as, you know, and that maybe it just 
So, yeah, okay, that, that the mark and things is just just a, a just another little piece of info about what he's doing yeah. right in the class that yeah. that really it's the class itself and what he's picking up from that. Yeah. That's really the most important piece. That's going to be for from his perspective um whether or not, you know, he's enjoyed it. it it's right. not going right. to be about what whatever his his grade was. That's fascinating. Yeah. And you know what? I really wanted to emphasize your observation too about his, how he sees himself as a learner. Like just okay, yeah. you know, in general that some some kids who like we were talking about before who aren't going to do well in the typical classroom are going to carry forward with that self image of I'm not yeah. a good learner. I don't learn well, yep. right? Whereas yeah. he having the space to learn the way he wanted to learn has always seen himself learning. Yep. And this is just yep. another place that he wants to go try out to learn some other things. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, he's, he, uh, is in it for, he's trying to get an exercise science degree. And so he's, he's interested in that and he's already run into this, you know, sometimes you have to take to get, yep. to get to X goal, you have to mm-hmm. do some stuff you don't, you're not interested in, but yep. you, have your eye on that goal down. So you do it. And, you know, I mean, and that's part of the learning process too, is learning how to not only do everything that's interesting to you, but sometimes do things that you have to do to reach, you know, that goal that you're set. Yeah, that's it. That's something that you hear quite often, right? That people will, they're never going to do anything hard if they, if you don't make them do something hard. But no, right. like there, there are so many moments in life where for your goal, for your long-term goal, whatever you're trying to achieve, there are steps along the way that outside of that goal, you wouldn't choose for yourself, right? right? Because right. they're not individually interesting, but that goal is important enough yeah. to you to do those other things. The right? motivation's intrinsic. Yes. There you, you go. <clears throat> You're really not, you're not doing it um, because somebody told you you have to, or because you're you have to get a specific grade that you know, or you think you're a terrible person or whatever. Um, you're doing it because you have your own purpose, you know. And I really that to me for unschooling with our kids, that's that's what I think is the difference with unschooling is it allows children to to live their childhoods, not just their adulthoods. Um, with meaning like yeah. you know th- that's what we try and do as adulthood as adults we try and live a meaningful life you know and and find the meaning in our lives is a huge part of of our adult life and a lot of times i think it's stunted because when you go through school you're doing so much stuff that's very often meaningless to you personally mm-hmm. or you find the meaning in the grade you got which yeah. May be great if you got a good grade, but if you're somebody who struggles to get good grades, then that's that means something really different about you and what you know. And so, and I just think that kids get trained out of the idea of doing meaningful things and and seeking meaning in what they're doing because you know what's what's the meaning of a fifth grader? You know, learning about you know, the economy of the mid-Atlantic states or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, so much of what's in the curriculum really isn't there because it in some way benefits the children to know this stuff, especially in this day and age when you have knowledge at your fingertips. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't, you don't need to spend all those years. And I just feel like that's the thing that really appeared appealed to me about um, unschooling was this idea that kids could spend their days doing things that had meaning to them. And, and I wonder if that's why so many kids, I think, who unschool get very into creative arts and creative activities is because there's so much personal meaning in creativity, you know? Um, uh. I mean, it's just a theory on my part, but I've, <clears throat> I've wondered about that. Yeah, no, that, that is really interesting. And you're right. And, and you see so much like when, when um, kids get out of school finally, right? And then they, they need to go take time to find themselves. Is like right. kind of the quote. It's because they've never been able to find what's meaningful for them because they've just been mm-hmm. so busy doing what they're told and doing what they're told. Yeah. And, and even being told, you know, this is what makes you a successful adult. 
you right. know, being told what path they're supposed to take. And, you know, some of us, like I jumped right into that path for a number of years and did the whole like regular thing before I started questioning. So yeah, that is one of the, the, the things that I love about unschooling too, is that the kids can get to know themselves, understand themselves, understand, start exploring the things they like. Like you said, that the, the creative side, having that space and time to, to do that. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, it? <laughs> yeah it really is. I, I, that's the thing that I've always felt the happiest watching our kids um, just use their days and use their hours and minutes in ways that, you know, had meaning for them. So yeah. Yeah, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge freedom that is, uh, although I'm always a little, I like the word freedom in regards to unschooling, but sometimes people like to a little caught up in what that means. Freedom means yeah. you can do anything, but that's, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> although it is applicable to deschooling. <laughs> but hey, you know, that probably leads nicely into our next question. Cause I, I wanted to dig into deschooling some more with you. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that that I see, um, but I don't think it's talked about very much, is around that I, the desire to identify as an unschooler, right? Because mm -hmm. our need, just as human beings, to belong to something is is strong enough that it's right there in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It sits right yeah. there. That need to belong, to feel loved. And when you discover unschooling and find some groups online or local groups, it's so exciting to find people who finally hold similar ideas to you, right? Yeah. About parenting yeah. and education and relationships with their children. It's like we found our tribe. And yet, exactly. yeah, but from there, if we hold on to that too tightly, that can get in our way, can't it? Yeah, well, I, it certainly did for me. Um, and I think part of it's because we live in this schooled culture, which is so much about comparison, mm -hmm. comparing yourself to others. And so my experience was even moving into and this. And this was as much with the idea of radical unschooling, getting more into the parenting side of, of unschooling and, and relationships with your children and stuff, that, you know, um, I had kind of a love hate relationship with some of the uh, online um, forums that you could read, you know, some of the Sandra Dodd things and, and, and uh, some of those places where you could interact with other unschoolers and, and get questions answered and see what the, what the long time, you know, expert unschoolers were saying and doing. And, yeah. and I could only take so much of it because I would, read what they were, and it's made so much perfect sense. And I wanted that for my family and trying to figure out how to re relax into unschooling was, you know, that was the really tricky path for me mm -hmm. because I saw what they had. I wanted that. And I was trying to kind of impose it almost because to me, that was being a successful unschooler, your family is supposed to look like this. And I kept reading things about how don't, you know, don't think of your child as who you want them to be. Look at who they are. And I could understand that intellectually, but, you know, if they weren't, if they weren't who I wanted, like trying to, trying to reconcile yeah, that, I'm yeah. trying to think of how to say it. <laughs> that was a really tricky thing because, um, because I wanted this identity as an unschooler, you know, it kind of, there was a security in being able to say, I'm doing this thing, but if I'm doing this thing, then I'm supposed to, you know, I felt like our family is supposed to be looking this certain way because this is what this thing is supposed to provide. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact is it's all a process, you know, you're on a path. And so, um, it was really uh, challenging for me to to learn what it meant to um, to let things to, to let go in the sense of stop trying to m manage our unschooling life so that we are unschoolers. If it's I don't know if that's I know doesn't that sound maybe it'll come yeah yeah but no it's right you know that for me that was that huge jump leap but journey <laughs> from um, intellectually understanding it to actually living and breathing it. 
right? Because when you intellectually understand it, you're looking for those things like unschoolers do yeah. this like they they don't have rules or you know right they, they they do this they don't have bedtimes or they don't tell their child what to learn they look at their child mm -hmm. but these are things we don't have experience in yet and we don't have the tools yet unless we've already right. been living that way you know what I mean well, yeah. um, so I found that if I was I, I would be trying really hard to stick to those things, but life was quite chaotic because right. I didn't know how to do those. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, if you I don't have rules. It's like, okay, then I step back and there's no rules, but, but then, then life is crazy and, and it's not helping any of us and we're all getting frustrated. Yet, as I keep going and keep learning, like like you said, you know, you, you have to step back at first because it's not, it's making sense. But even when I'm when I'm trying to implement it in my family and do it, it's not turning out like they're describing <laughs> it, right? It's it's exactly. but, like how do you do that? You guys all sit around and and everybody's happy and talking and y'all work things out and and off everybody goes. It it is that transition to like uh, it's not about the we don't have rules. It's really about the whole process and how do we engage with each other and how do we connect and how do we move through those moments. That's the important part. But the we don't have rules is the easy thing to say because it, right. it's true and it gets it across quickly. But it doesn't really explain at all what we do after. And there's that huge <laughs> that and and. I see that as, as a huge piece of de-schooling, right? It's that huge movement from understanding why there's no rules per se um, to actually understanding how I can live it and what tools and things I do instead rather than just standing back and letting right. chaos reign, right? Right. Well, and I think for me, part of it was um, like I had this idea that if you're an unschooling family, there's a lot of peace. Mm -hmm. and to me, peace was the conflict yeah. so if we're a good on a good unschooling family this always goes back to the comparison you know yeah yeah you know comparing yourself to others who are succeeding at doing it you know then then they're everybody would be getting along mm -hmm. you know um because that's that's what unschooling leads to is people getting along and peacefulness and peaceful relationships and why aren't they <laughs> you know, it was, Really, that was a, a very challenging part of it for me was to um, to get out of the way of other people's relationships because I got really good at trying to manage, uh, you know, the kids' relationships with each other or their relationship with their dad. If I didn't like what I saw, something going on there, you know, like I was always trying to like get in there and you know here's how it's done <laughs> because it needs to be people, right because that's exactly that's the identity that we're striving for and we think right. we need to be right in there Ma like you said managing it right like Whether well if you can't be peaceful on your own let me come in here and show you how it's done <laughs> as you can imagine it didn't work very well um but yeah so that was a big piece of it and the other thing that i've noticed i still haven't figured out how if there's any any good answers about it is you know you see on these forums a lot of time people who are new to it asking about well how do I don't how do I do this if I don't have rules around food or you know screens or whatever it is and talking about like I took the rules away and we descended into chaos and and you know long time on scores will say well go very slowly be very gradual about it and and there's definitely sense in that. I mean, it is the the healthy way to to proceed. But the hitch is that, and I remember this clearly for myself. Like when you begin to see the, or it clicks for you that oh yeah, trying to control things and having all these rules no you're not allowed to watch tv after you know or until certain time like all of a sudden you begin to see the arbitrariness of it and you're trying to get away from the arbitrariness you know there's this advice that's often there is just say 
say no less often. Mm -hmm. But as the parent, once you've seen the arbitrariness of it, how do you decide when to say no? Because like, if it just seems arbitrary to have rules around screens, then as a parent, you want to just go, okay, that is dumb. So we're not going to have rules around screens. But if you do that to children who are used to having, you know, they having some sense of boundaries in their lives of what's, what's acceptable and what's not, what, what do we do and what don't we do, that kind of thing. And then as a parent, you can philosophically see, see that, you know, why you don't need that. You rip it away and the kids are flailing all over the place trying to figure out, well, wait, you know, what, what are the limits of, of what, what's allowed, you know, because you can't, as an unschooler, just do everything. You can't go to your neighbor's house and paint their walls just because you felt create. I mean, like there are limits to what you can do. And, and where are those limits? Children need to have a clear idea of how, what kind of behavior is acceptable and what isn't. And in your private home, it might be somewhat different than it is at, you know, Aunt Jill's house. You know what I mean? So, so then they're always trying to figure out, okay, so, so what can I do and what can't I do? And, and then, you know, I just, I'm not sure how to, what to tell new parents about that kind of thing. Cause I just think that that's the, the hardest struggle is to figure out, well, are you just supposed to arbitrarily say no sometimes just so that you are sometimes saying like, <laughs> yeah, you know, as a parent, <laughs> what, what now, what now do you use as a judgment for when you should say no and when you shouldn't? Because if you mostly think, oh yeah, that was a dumb rule. I don't need that rule. And you want to toss it out. Um, that's what, that's what, yeah, that's what feels right. And that's what, you know, but it just leaves the kids in chaos. So I just, I don't really know what the answer to that. Maybe it's just that transitions are messy. Yeah, that's one way, that's definitely one way to look at it. I mean, for me, when I think back, because you're right, it was, it was hard to do it bit by bit. And I wouldn't really say we did (laughs) because you're right. Most don't, I feel Most don't, because when you see it, it it now feels contradictory to yourself to use it. So right. what worked for me, I think, and and we, you know, the, it, it is messy. Transitions are messy. Life is messy. Okay, um, right. it was more about okay. I'm not going to say no, but I'm going to talk about the constraints that you were talking about. Right. You know, these are the kind of stuff we do at our house, but, you know, maybe not at the neighbor's house, you know, maybe, right. maybe not at cert- at these times. You know, you don't go knocking on the door of your friend at 11 o'clock at night or, you know, right. those kinds of things. So instead of saying no, I would more start a conversation around the actual con- like the reasons I would have mm-hmm. thought no might be a good answer. You know, so. Um, we're watching TV and or playing a game or something, you know, and we have to get up early the next morning. So instead of saying no, when they ask to watch another episode or do another level or something like that, it was more of a conversation around, well, what do you think? We got to get up at this time because we want to do this. And I found really what that the a huge piece of that de-schooling transition is so much more engagement with our kids than we had before. Right. Yep. Right. Because now we're talking to them. We're learning about them. We're we're now bringing up conversations around things that are going on. So like, yes and no are really shortcuts. Rules. Mm-hmm. Rules are yep. shortcuts for seemingly logical things. But then we mm-hmm. notice the arbitrary like because it's eight o'clock. OK, no, you know. Eight o'clock was just kind of uh, an idea of it's getting later in the evening. Right. Right. You know, this is approximately when you guys usually get tired. So we used eight o'clock because that's easy. Right. It's an easy, quick answer. But now we're not having the easy and quick answers anymore. We're having the conversations instead. And it's it is it's a lot of conversations and it's a lot. We're learning about each other so much and and just the the back and forth. It, It is a lot of effort. But this is what we're choosing, right? When it we're is. choosing unschooling, this is part and parcel of the whole thing. Because if you just yeah. toss the rules, um, 
you know, and, and just say yes. Although that's another thing, you know, that, uh, don't say no as much say yes more people will take that as a rule too and we say yes all the time and no matter what and and then you know it, that doesn't work out well either again you're back back into chaos when and you're you know bending yourself into a pretzel trying to accomplish all these yeses but when you bring up the conversation and the context and the real people involved right your sister's really tired you know it's probably not a good thing for us to go out you know, to right. Park right this moment, but you know, maybe after yeah. she has a nap or maybe when dad gets home and you know, he can stay with her while she sleeps and we can go, you know, it's, it's bringing in all this context. And at first the thing with rules and kids, I think conventionally is that we don't think they can have those conversations. Right. Right. But right. They really can. Well, and I have to be honest, I never, I never tried, um, unschooling we didn't come to it until our yeah, youngest was turning six yeah so I've never gone through the phase of you know trying to raise little little mm-hmm. tiny children I mean right now actually yeah, our maybe. oldest is married and she has a, a baby girl well she turned two in January and I the, I'm daycare because <laughs> they both work yeah so she comes to me every day and uh and even though our oldest was the one who went all the way through school she she asked me and before she got pregnant, you know, when we start a family, would you like unschool and help us unschool our, our children? Mm-hmm. So I'm sort of on board now with the next generation. I have to say, it's one thing I've really noticed, and it might partly be the, the buffer of this not being my child, but my grandchild, but doing it now to, you know, starting, she's two years old and she's getting right into that, do it myself, you know, everything. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, one of my struggles that I, I was constantly uh, dealing, hashing out with in myself was I didn't want my kids to be disappointed. I wanted them to be, to be living happy lives. I mean, unschoolers are supposed to be peaceful and happy and, blah, blah, you know, like there was all these sh- sh- shoulds, all these kind of labels and conceptions I had of what you, we were supposed to look like as unschoolers. Mm-hmm. And so you know, that was part of what hung me up is even having those conversations is, you know, it didn't feel okay to me for, you know, some kid to be disappointed or having a meltdown or like, you know, yeah, it's a lot of stress and pressure. I, you know, that it was all self-imposed. Yeah. It was probably because I didn't really know how to relax around. I mean, that was the journey is learning how to just, uh, let go and let people have their disappointment and have the, you know, and not and because, and I guess that was part of it for me was this idea is that we're trying to uh, not help our kids always be happy, but there is this idea in unschooling that you are trying to help children do the things that do make them happy. And so I felt like there was part of me that whenever my kids weren't happy, and then I was failing as an unschooling mom, you know, and it could mm-hmm. get in it, it, and it really created a lot of problems because then it was like, well, that means my kids aren't allowed to be unhappy, except that they're human beings. And <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. doesn't work very well. <laughs> you know, that's just part of me. And so if, for yeah. me, I mean, it might have been just a lot of the, the internal pressures and things that, you know, uh, yeah that I personally brought to unschooling. I mean, I feel like I I see them echoed out there here in a bit, you know, in other um, unschooling forums. I think that might come from your, like your success in school. I was going to say, did you, do you think that might have, have come from how well you were trained? I was trained, you know, at school to like, okay, I got to find out what the parameters are, what, what what is right what is good in this lifestyle and and attack it and if it's not working well then then it's my fault and because yeah there's there's definitely I was a rule follower yeah you know like I followed the rules and so I think that there was definitely a part of me as I moved into unschooling I was looking for well what are the rules of unschooling yeah and and you will have the the long time experienced unschoolers tell you stop looking for rules about unschooling and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, 
11 years or whatever it is down there. I, oh, okay. Now, now I know no, what you I, meant. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I was geared to, well, what are the rules? Like, how do I know I'm unschooling if I'm not following the rules? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So and one of the rules was the kids are supposed to be happy. They're supposed to be getting along. They're supposed to be peace, which meant no conflict. In the it was like, I had this whole... Yeah. you know, picture of this is how unschooling works. It's inside this box and I just need to like apply all of these, you know. But the, the most spectacular thing though, right, is once you're through or you never finish, but the bulk of that de-schooling journey, it, it really, that's where you end up, right? You end up mm-hmm. with yeah. this peace. You end up with this level of trust with your kids. You end up with these relationships. And you end up with all the things that you heard about, but that at first you were striving for through meeting these rules until right. you understood yeah. that, oh, it's about us. You know, there are no rules about unschooling. It doesn't make sense until you actually can get there in your own family, right? And see it in action. Right drop that yeah. piece and, and really start living it. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it is. It makes a tremendous amount of sense because like that, that is really what I saw happen. And, you know, one of the things that, that pained me hugely starting into unschooling is um, because we had very traditionally parented our kids up till that point. Um, so they were turning six and all the way up to 16, you know? So, uh, is they had very competitive relationships with, I mean, it's not that they never got along and when they were, when they were smaller, they definitely, you know, there was always whoever was the baby got baby by everybody, you know, like there, there was sweetness there for sure. But I was always distressed by how, you know, kind of nasty and unkind and competitive they could be with each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, And I wanted them to be great friends. I wanted them to, you know, and so that was always part of it for me was trying to manage their relationships so that they'd be nice to each other, you know, Um, and, uh, and learning to relax around that and, um, and sort of become not an arbiter, but a a bit of a sounding board, you know, Mm -hmm. like if they needed to, to, well, you know, so and so, blah, 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 and, you know, and just like hearing what they had to say and validating what was, you know, understandable and useful for them and offering another perspective that, you know, you know, and just becoming not somebody who was getting in there trying to make them get along, but just kind of assisting them in being in relationship with each other in a way that's, you know, they're still making the choice about how am I, how am I going to hold this? How am I going to react to this? But, um, you know, so I wasn't forcing them in a different direction, but just offering information and feedback and perspective that they, you know, it, it made a real difference to just kind of step back and create some room around that. And if they, you know, ended up arguing or whatever, just not taking that on myself and letting them, you know, not in a way like where they just get to go and beat each other up, yeah, yeah. but where they get to, you know, um, to learn how to get it figured out between the two of them. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting thing because there was part of me that felt like I wasn't supposed to do that as an unschooling mom. I was supposed to, you know, always be right there, you know, but it's a tricky balance because it's also not healthy to just kind of like, you don't want to be neglecting if there's a piece yeah. of it there, there's a role for mom and dad to help the kids uh, support them in learning how to get along. So figuring out how to play that role in a way that lets them have their own relationship with each other um, and and isn't completely neglecting, but also just not totally, you know, tightening all around it so it's really interesting but it what's it's been kind of interesting to me now with um having our granddaughter here is how much I can just be with her you know when it's time to do something and she doesn't want to do it and she's growing or something 
<laughs> and just not like when with my own kids, it just felt like there was this part of me that was like, I can't stand, you know, having, you know, I felt like I was torturing them. And then I'd kind of resent the fact that they're acting like this because now, you know, it's hard on me. Mm-hmm. And there's just that, there's a lot of space around that with my granddaughter, which I think is partly because she's a granddaughter, not a ch- my own child. There's a little buffer there. But mm-hmm. also just partly, I think it's because of what I've been through as an unschooling parent learning to just let people be, you know, having the experience they're having and not trying to manage their experience for them, you know? Yeah, so, no, that is awesome, Leah. And I, I, I love the way you describe that. You know, I, that whether or not where to step, I, I like to think of that as kind of, I, maybe it was Pam Sarushian who meant, who called it that or that I heard called that dance, that dance mm-hmm. of relationships, but dance of parenting, you know, that metaphor seems so apt to me yes. because it changes over time and it's like, Oh, did I, you know, should I step this way, this way? What's the beat of the moment? Right. Right. Are we moving fast? Are we moving slow? Like there's so much context of not only the moment itself, what's happening in the moment. It also who's involved in the moment. Right. Right. You know, um, maybe what plans have I made with that child before? Because, you know, it's beautiful because we went from, okay, I'm not going to manage that. To, but I'm not going to step back and do nothing. Like it works right. here in in sibling relationships as well, and our relationships with our kids. Mm-hmm. It's the conversations, and like you said, and my experience too. It was individual conversations with my kids, mm-hmm. kind of usually like after some sort of encounter that didn't go well. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, okay. you're not you're not letting it go crazy or people get hurt or anything and you're kind of watching from the sidelines to step in when you feel they would like the help but again what they learn most when it's their experience and then you can talk to them after and help them process and validate like you were talking about and add you know I can say well you know I think he or she, you know, meant this when they said that or this, right. what they were thinking right. or feeling, you know, not. Right. And that's once you validated their perspective, because you know what, in those moments, everybody's perspective is really valid. Like, and that was the great right. thing about having the conversations individually. You didn't have somebody else in there who felt they needed to defend themselves. Right. 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 Or in validate. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, exactly. Or like, yeah. what do you mean you understand what they were saying? Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> whose side are you on anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I actually think that what you're getting at there is, is the, that idea that there are no rules being on, that there's a flexibility. Mm-hmm. There's not, okay this happened and my response as the parent should be this, you yeah. know, getting away from that should thing. So you're actually, you're really, and this is where the whole mindfulness in parenting, you know, in unschooling comes up is you're right there in the moment responding to what's going on in the moment, in the context it's in. You're not, you're not running to a rule book and saying, okay, in this case, what am I supposed to be doing? You know, you're, you're just there. And you're, you're kind of winging it, but you're winging it with a lot of knowledge. And, um, and if, you know, I think that if you're, you're in a good place to be doing it, you're doing it with a lot of sort of just internal space and flexibility about how this is all going to turn out. Because the management thing is all about trying to get to this specific goal or end, or it's supposed to turn out X way. And and when you're not invested in, well, where is this going? Am I, am I going to be able to be okay with the outcome? But mm-hmm. you're just really there in, in the moment, moment helping facilitate whatever it is, whether it's, you know, uh, an interaction between others or, you know, just the, the feedback and, and conversations you're having with your own children or whatever it is. I, that was the piece of it. I think that when it clicked for me, it was learning how to let go of the outcome and stop trying because that all of that control, all of the management, all of the um, you know wanting to to have rules and all of the comparison piece of it, all of that was tied up into it's supposed to end like 
this. you know, this yeah. thing. <laughs> and when you can just let go of that, oh, it, it has to end like this. And just kind of be like, in it for the ride. Where is it going to go? I mean, then what happens, like you were saying, is you go through this whole process all of these years and, and it, it's still a process. It's not like you can mm-hmm. go, okay, I'm letting go. And, yeah. just, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's a process. You're growing and changing through this as, you know, but you get through that and miraculously out the other side of things, you are as a family in a very different place, which is not about having no conflicts. You know, because yep. that's not what the peace is. Or, peace or is, life being about, perfect, right? Right, right. And everybody's always happy and nothing bad ever happens. I mean, like, yeah. you know, it's you're just living real life in real relationships, which sometimes are strained and stressful, but there's such a solid layer of trust and companionship. And, you know, everybody becomes, begins to kind of like adopt that, flexibility Mm -hmm. and and you know so there isn't all this everybody in their rigid places trying to defend their territory it's just you know everybody's allowed to or willing to step aside for this person who needs you know and anyway it's just like it just it all works out but it's all about letting go (laughs) is what i yeah (laughs) yeah oh that that's spectacular. Yeah. And you know what? I love how through our conversation, we've ended up hitting on just about every question I had without even <laughs> having oh, questions. Going back to the we questions. Went, <laughs> we went to healing sibling relationships. We went to mindfulness and unschooling. Yep. And, and, and I love it. And I have goosebumps because that was very similar to my journey. And, and you know what? That's how, why I ended up writing the unschooling journey as a book, right? Because it really was a process. It really was a journey. You couldn't, you just, without taking that journey, that growth, that understanding, you can't get there from here. Right. Right. You don't like, you're get, not, like, you're like, not, like we try at the beginning, you know, and, and of course you do like, because that's how we know, we know these yeah. are the rules. These, this is, this is how an unschooling family, you know, behave looks like on the outside. Right. Right. They look peaceful. They look like they don't have rules. You know, they look like all their kids get along just fine. You know, everything looks nice. And and then we are okay. That's what an unschooling family looks like. That's what I want to do and be. And I would love our family to be like that. Okay. So these are the things they do. Right. The, they say, yes, Mm -hmm. they, they don't have, you know, all those things from the outside, but we don't see the inside. We don't see, like you said, I think that whole de-schooling, de-schooling journey is about developing that foundation. You said of companionship, of trust, of connection, that is what gives you that outcome and it consistently does because we know hundreds and thousands of of unschooling parents who who have taken that journey and who are in that place right those are the experienced unschoolers online who are sharing those stories right right but because it's so individual and you're building that foundation with the individuals in your family it's not about the just imposing the framework Right. On right. top of your own family. No, you right. have to build that whole layer yourself and then you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's really what it is, is it uh it's a practice. Like yeah. just like mindfulness is a practice. Yeah. It's a practice of learning how to be right there and how to let go of expectations. And and I used to think that meant I wasn't supposed to let go of all the expectations I could have of my children for anything. And you know, it took me a while to realize that no, I can I can have some expectations around it. It's letting go of the expectation that it's all going to look like this or, you know, my expectations about, about my goals for everything. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, that's really, yeah. And it's, it's, that's the journey of it. And you can't take somebody else's experience, you know, and just translate, you know, just transfer it over. And now you have that too. To me, it's, it's kind of like a, the fairy tale thing. Like, you know, you, you read a fairy tale and it always ends with, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> well, what does that look like? You know, because there's this kind of 
romantic. Oh, this unschooling vision is just this, this beautiful thing. I can see, I want to live that vision. And, and you lived happily ever after. Well, how, how did you live happily ever after? Cause then Prince Charming and you know, the princess go home and now they have to <laughs> dig in and start working their lives. You know, I mean, they lived happily ever after in the sense that, you know, and you don't get to see that part of the story. And that's what a lot of it, these forms are kind of like, is you're, you're hearing the fairy tale and they lived happily ever after, but that's kind of where the story, you know, ends in terms of your, your knowledge of the details, because how they got to any individual family, you know, they Mm. went through their own, you know, working out the messiness of life to figure out how to, to live happily ever after, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what just hit me was, is so often, you know, the initial, the, the questions from, from newer people coming to unschooling who are starting their deschooling journey. Right. Um, and I completely remember being in that space and yeah. I'm sure you do too, Leah. And it's like, but for you, but I have five kids that I have to manage or, but this, like, like we, we still have, we have that vision, but it's a little bit different for me, but I have this little problem, Mm -hmm. but you know, Mm -hmm. but my kid will do nothing but watch TV or play video, but my kid, you know, doesn't know how to read yet. And they're such a age, you know, there's always something that, but, but how do I make it work for me? But how do I make it work for me? Right. And, and as you know, having gone through the journey, we realized that it's really not about that question. You know, once you get, it's about developing that foundation, because once you have that foundation, you can work through all those questions. Right. But, but those questions are so pressing at the beginning. Right. Right. You know, so sometimes it's very frustrating when you have those questions and they say, you know, just relax, just relax. Like, how can I relax? There's no peace in my home. Just answer my question. And, and, you know, I I feel for them so much, you know, and and, because I find even in, you know, in our summit group, we have a private Facebook group and I love the questions and I love that they're how they're asking them. And yet I find so often, um, I'm answering kind of the same way, which I love, which I, it's one of my favorite things to do, which is why I have a podcast about unschooling, (laughs) because I like to take that, that moment, how you're seeing it and, and get down into the foundation because it it feels like, uh, I hope they don't mind that my answer seems to be like the same thing all the time. I end up at the same place, but it's because foundationally you do get to that same place. That's the piece to learn about how you see the situation to be able to process it. And then all of a sudden it's something you learn to be able to do in your own life through that de-schooling journey is take, Oh, well, look at this interesting thing that's happening in our lives. How can I, you know, bring that down and use that trust and connection and everything and that openness, like you were saying, and, and that not having the expectation of the outcome, right? That mind, mindfully approaching it that the approach is the same for whatever the thing is that comes up right does that that make sense no it does well I I really think that that what tends to hang us up and it's partly just a human thing yeah um is that we are very attached to our outcomes and what we want to have happen and that's we're very attached right we're so attached yes. to them that if things aren't looking like they're going to go in that direction, that's where the fear kicks in. Yes. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be 25 and not reading, you know, or yeah. whatever right. the thing is, we, we take, we, we see that outcome. That's why we talk so much about our fear being really just being us projecting things into the future because it's right. our expectation about something down the line. Right. And that's, it's, it's all, yeah. Yeah, no, and that's the, the one thing, like, thinking about that, you know, um, and I've done so. I did some reading, it was actually a little later on in the process for me, I mean, just in the last mm-hmm. few years, I started getting a lot into reading Pema Chodron's works, you know, mm-hmm. which is all centered on Tibetan Buddhism and things, and, and um, there's a story that she tells, and it's, I've seen it other places too, um, about 
<clears throat> and the, the punchline, just jumping to that, because that's the important part, is somebody talking about being more curious than afraid. And, and I, like, to me, that's like, that's the piece of it. Yeah. If you want to be, you know, live an unschooling life that, and, and walk that journey of de-schooling into, you know, that space where things are open and flexible and relaxing, be more curious than afraid, you know, so that that's how you, when you're responding, you're tightening up around some idea of how you wanted this to look or whatever, you step back and you just decide you're going to look at it with curiosity rather than fear that it's not going to be this thing you want it to be. And I just think that that's like, that's the huge piece of it. If we can learn to become more curious rather than so attached, Mm -hmm. It just creates that, like the space opens up and you begin to learn like the whole breathing thing. I mean, that's a huge thing in schooling is breathe. Well, that's what the breathing is. It's just this it's, openness to what's going to happen and you're still really paying attention. That fear. Yeah. You know, because yeah. because fear, fear becomes a physical feeling in your, in your body, right? It's a tenseness, yep. you know, and then you get that tunnel vision and, and you can't be creative or curious when you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and and you're tense and you're breathing more shallowly, like the adrenaline's running, everything. So yeah, that's I, I, you hear that a lot. Just take take a couple of deep breaths, just to try and wash some of that out, so that you can become a little bit more curious, step by step. Yeah. I love that. That's that's beautiful. And and you know what? As you said it, I'm like, that's a perfect thing. More curious than afraid. And it sounds like something beautiful for an unschooling, you know, experienced unschooling parent to share and somebody new coming in. Okay. I'm really curious about how we're going to get there. <laughs> right. Well, it's something that you understand more deeply while you go through the journey. Like yep. I, when Sandra was on um, the podcast, she talked about, you know, when, when you start, you don't realize, but really you're, you're looking at like a black and white photo. And as you go through the journey, you discover the color the color starts yeah. to appear because you don't even know what's missing until you're open right. and curious and, and keep going and try it. And for, for me, I'm more of a words person. So for me, right. it's about the language. It's like when we say things like to new unschoolers, like be, be curious, more curious and afraid, or, you know, all, all those, those breathe more, all those little tidbits, they, they make sense on that level. Like, intellectually like okay okay but once you live them those words mean so much more like you yeah. know when you say someone we don't have bedtimes conventionally or someone new to it just just imagines chaos because they can't envision that layer of trust and connection and all those things that are right. underneath it that mean we don't have chaos we're figuring things out and everybody's right. taking care of themselves and helping out their other family members or friends or whatever, like, but they can't see that piece. They can't see that color yet. Right. Right. Because they, they yeah. haven't got that far along the journey to experience it. Right. Well, and they've also been told yeah. what a mess the picture is going to look like if yeah. they do that. That's true. Right. <laughs> I mean, that absolutely the conventional message is that's exactly what's going to happen. And you know what, like we talked about the, it, 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 can happen and it does happen without that yet, right? Because at first you don't have that built. So you're starting this journey and you're starting to do those things without a really thick foundation. That's that's what yep. you're building. But you don't, you know, you don't really know it yet. So so you what you see is what you kind of expected to see. Right. 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 Oh, that's so true. I mean, we totally do. We, we look, we always see what, what we expect. I mean, it's part of that confirmation bias. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> In the unschooling uh, sense of, yeah, yeah. no, that, that is very true. Oh, so, oh yeah. my goodness. Well, Leah, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I had so much fun. Yeah. I, I loved this. It was very fun to, to meet you and, uh, mm -hmm. To talk about one of my favorite topics. Oh, I know. I, <laughs> I don't have know. that many people in my life that I can just go on and on. And <laughs> right. <laughs> and they know I, what I mean. I don't sound crazy to them. 
<laughs> right. That that's why I need all these all these phone calls, these, you know, podcast calls. It's like I can dive right in because yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of people around where you can have this this kind of conversation. I love it so much. Thank you. And yes, before we go, well, where you. is the best place for people to connect with you online if they'd like to? Are you around? I would say probably um, Facebook, Facebook Messenger. Uh, oh. You know that would, I'm I'm on Facebook under my name Leah Rose. This is what I look like. <laughs> With these glasses, my hair is a little different, I think, on my profile picture. But <laughs> anyway, from Pennsylvania, that might be another. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I would say probably Facebook would be the, the easy. I, I don't do a whole lot of social media. I'm actually just toying with starting a blog, but not specifically about unschooling. It would mm-hmm. be a, just sort of. I have a lot of. I think. I think a lot. <laughs> getting getting my thoughts out on paper about whatever's going on anyway um but i don't even have that up and running yet but so i would say probably facebook oh that's awesome thanks again you have a wonderful day yeah thank you bye